It's my pleasure to welcome you to Career Conversations Digital Media, featuring an impressive panel of college alum. My name is PJ Lewis. I'm a 1999 graduate of the college, and I'm Vice President, Global Brand Marketing and Category Lead at Mattel in Los Angeles. And I'm a member of the Penn Arts and Sciences Ambassador Council, an alumni advisory board that partners with the advancement team to enrich student and alumni experience through volunteer involvement, intellectual engagement, and philanthropy. The Career Conversations event series was created by the Ambassador Council to showcase different career paths alumni have taken as a way to share and educate with alumni and students on different industries and steps to take if they're interested in that field. Tonight's career conversation will focus on digital media and our three panelists will provide insight on the fast changing environment in this field. Alexandria James, a 2015 graduate of the college will be moderating our panel this evening. Alexandria is currently the social media director and content producer at Thrive Global. She began her career here at Penn where she worked in the athletics department as both a host and sideline reporter for Penn football and men's and women's basketball teams. After receiving her degree in communications with a minor in journalism, Alexandria went on to work at Sports Illustrated as a social media producer and breaking news writer. She later became the assistant digital and social media manager at Sports Illustrated Swimsuit before joining Thrive Global in 2019. Welcome, Alexandria. Thank you for being here this evening and for leading this discussion. And I'm now gonna turn it over to Alexandria to take it on. Thank you, PJ. Hello, everyone. I'm Alexandria James, and I am so excited to be here tonight with fellow college alumni who are going to share with you their insights on careers in digital media. These panelists all have had interesting career journeys within digital media and are really looking forward to sharing their insights with all of you. And there, also, there will also be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of our discussion, so please feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. To get us started this evening, I'll have each panelist give a brief introduction of themselves. We'll start with Blake Stuchin, who is the Vice President and Head of Digital Media Business Development at the NFL. Blake, over to you. Thank you so much, Alexandria. It's great to be here with everybody tonight. Um, I am a proud Penn alum class of 2004. Uh, I was a student in the college when I was an undergrad. I graduated from Annenberg with a BA in communication with a concentration in political communication. And uh, I currently work as vice president and head of digital media business development at the National Football League. I've been at the NFL for 10 years and uh, looking forward to chatting with everybody about this tonight. Thank you, Blake. Next, we have Karina Piedrahita, currently head of agency brand measurement at Google. Welcome, Karina. Hello, everyone. Glad to be here. Um, so I graduated the college in 03, uh, and I've had about a 20-year career in research measurement and analytics. Uh, I joke that it technically started at Penn. I was a content coder for an Annenberg professor, and I loved it. And he actually pointed me in the direction of market research, and that's where I've been ever since. Uh, I started my career officially uh, at CNN, working for Warner Media, doing television research. Uh, I then transitioned to digital research, CNN.com, uh, NBA.com, uh, which I'm, I know Blake is very uh, aware of. Um, and then most recently, uh, for about five years, I've been working at Google. Um, and my team is focused on helping advertising agencies measure the impact of their advertising cam campaigns on YouTube. Awesome. Thank you so much, Karina. And our third panelist tonight is Chantel Fleischfresher, Senior Director of Global Brand and Marketing Integrated Experience at Marriott International. Chantel, take it away. Great. Thanks. It's so nice to be here with all of you tonight. Um, so I'm actually originally from Brazil, and I grew up between Brazil and the U.S. So I was uh, also part of the college class of 2004. Uh, I majored in European history with minors in film and music and Italian. Um, I um, have had a career that spans, I was a journalist for five years. I then sort of 
um, moved over to the marketing side, uh, first with Spotify and then with BuzzFeed. And I've been with Marriott now for close to six years, uh, originally in Brazil and now based out of uh, Marriott headquarters. Uh, my role is really focused on um, collaborating with both digital and marketing teams to ensure that our marketing strategies and objectives are pulled through on our digital channels and that we're offering customers a compelling and a relevant experience throughout the digital guest journey. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chantal. All right, let's jump into this, shall we? So there are so many aspects of digital media that I think it would be really helpful for each of you to speak a little more in depth about your current role so we can gain a better understanding of the many facets within that digital media umbrella. Karina, would you like to start with this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so Google, Google is obviously a consumer uh, product first. We build Android and Gmail for consumers, but there are two, um, groups within Google, the large groups, that also are in the digital media field. So the first is advertising technology and media technology. So we uh, sell and support different types of technology that allow a Coca-Cola, for example, and Blake, I'm gonna use your website as, a, as, as an example as well here, um, allow Coca-Cola to buy an ad on the NFL.com. Uh, Google serves that ad, and then we are able to report back to NFL and Coca-Cola how many times the ad was clicked on, was the ad effective? Um, there's another side of Google Media, which is the digital publisher side, and that's where I work, uh, specifically for YouTube. So as I mentioned, um, I lead a team that partners with advertising agencies. What we do day to day is partner with the large agencies and their clients, which include Coca-Cola and others, and we help them measure the effectiveness of their YouTube campaigns. We really try to help them understand which ads are working, which ads are not. If it's a cereal brand, for example, uh, like a Kellogg's, did the ad on YouTube actually help them sell more cereal? Uh, and we are constantly trying to help advertisers and agency optimize to get the best return on, on investment uh, for their advertising on YouTube. Um, so that's what I do, but taking a little bit of a step back, there is an entire business org that uh, supports um, Google uh, sales, including YouTube, including Google search. And there's a ton of roles within that. I'm in the advertising side, but there's business development, there's strategy, there's legal, there's, there's a ton of uh, business roles that are supporting our, our large group of engineers that are building these technologies and these ad products and these products for consumers. Awesome. Like you want to take it away? Sure. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in, Alexandria. So it helps to get to the specifics of what the NFL and what my team does in digital media. It actually starts with media. So we're obviously a sports league first. And then as part of that, uh, media is a core part of what we do. The NFL is 103 years old. For 83 of those 103 years, the NFL has had a relationship with media, largely in the form of our live games being available on first television and radio, and now in a really broad set of other distribution channels. Um, what my team is responsible for is thinking about all the different ways that we engage with fans and ultimately run a commercial business around that. There are three ways that we do that. One is our live games, the distribution strategy around it. Literally the agreements that we have and the commercial partnerships with ESPN, Fox, CBS, NBC, DirecTV, Verizon, and others that carry live NFL games in the United States and around the world. The second is the owned and operated media assets of the NFL. We have a cable network, NFL Network, as well as another channel, NFL Red Zone, which broadcasts live around the world to all of the fans that are watching it. We have a website, NFL.com, an app, several subscription products like Game Pass, which carries every single NFL game from every single broadcast camera angle, in enabling you to do everything from Telestrate to be able to cut your own highlights, all available for fans. And we run a fantasy product as well as a series of legalized sports betting partnerships. The third prong of that is all of our media partnerships. So if you think that's a lot, the other thing that we do is we work with just about every major company to create content to reach people very simply wherever they are, whether that's on YouTube, working with Karina's colleagues, as with the NFL, we are the largest sports partner on YouTube in the United States, whether that's on Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, Giphy, 
Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and a whole host of other distribution endpoints, we're thinking about all of it. So the reason that I say it starts as it relates to media for the NFL with TV and radio is that that's where our live games began and emanate from. They're just now in a broader set of endpoints than ever before. In addition to that, we build a business 24-7, 365 around all of the other things that fans can do when we're not playing live games. In addition to those three hours a week that our teams are playing for 17 weeks, uh, 17 times in an 18 week season over the regular season, we're creating all kinds of content to feed every one of those channels and reach our fans. The role that we have ultimately is to manage the partnerships with all of these different endpoints to create content for each of these platforms and ultimately to figure out how we can engage fans to grow the sport, support our partners in so doing, and help them and the NFL make money. That's the business at its core. What's exciting about it, uh, especially being leaned into digital, is just how constantly changing it is. Definitely. Chantel? Great. Um, thank you, Andrea. Um, first of all, I love how varied our experiences are, and uh, I just think it's a great way to sort of exemplify the breadth of what it means to work in digital media. So I, I think it's just really great. Um, in my case, Marriott is first and foremost a hotel company, right? Um, but with 30 brands and um, 8,000 odd hotels in the broader portfolio, managing the digital ecosystem is the behemoth, right? And everything you do, you have to do at scale. Um, in my case, I've had in my career sort of a lot of experience with digital marketing at the hotel level, so individual hotel level initially, and also at the regional or continent level. So my role today is in part to bring that perspective around what the customer needs when they're in the process of booking a stay, as well as what the marketer needs in order to do their job effectively and efficiently, and to do right not only by uh, these stakeholders, in other words, right, these, the customer, the end customer, the marketer, the individual brand, right, um, the hotel business as a whole, and of course our, our owners, right, the hotel owners. So there, um, it's a multifaceted sort of organization, and um, there's some really interesting and complex sort of business problems to solve. And so when we when we approach our work, we have to do it with an eye towards all of these different moving pieces. Um, when we talk about digital media, we often refer to sort of paid, owned, and earned media, right? Um, so paid essentially meaning sort of the advertising portion, right? The, the media that you are um, paying to put out there in the uh, ecosystem to get people to come to you. Um, earned being sort of social media, PR, things that you're not necessarily paying for, but that you're putting out into the world to gain engagement and recognition. And then owned, right? Namely sort of web, app, channels, uh, places where you sort of fully control the message and um, can, uh, you know, develop the ecosystem in a way that creates uh, the customer experience that you want to provide. So in the past, I've worked in social, certainly, and most recently in paid media strategy for Marriott, but my current role is really focused on collaborating across teams to drive that cohesive and relevant owned channel experience that ladders up to the company's broader marketing and business objectives. Awesome. Thank you all so much. It really is so fascinating to hear about what goes into your different roles. And while your day-to-days like look totally different, one thing you all have in common is your degree from Penn. <laughs> so in thinking about your current role or maybe even previous positions, how has your liberal arts degree contributed to your success? And is there any advice you'd really want to give to your 20-year-old college self? Blake, I'll throw it to you. There are so many pieces of advice I would give to my 20 year old college self and most of them most of them have nothing to do with my career in digital media so um, I, uh, I have I have a lot of happy memories of food choices in West Philadelphia in particular that come to mind of advice that I would give to my 20 year old self right now but um, you know as it relates to a career in digital media a, a couple things first um, in my case, I've had an unusual um, career to be in the role that I'm in. I've been um, at various points in my career, a web developer, a marketer, an investment banker, and now a sports industry executive that, that sort of thinks about a number of these topics together, all in the media business, but doing very different things. Um, what Penn prepared me for 
um, though I didn't appreciate it as well at the time, was the fact that um, I was uh, able to get a broad set of exposure to different types of topics, none of which were intended to be pre-professional. What I actually really greatly appreciated with all of our friends on the Wharton campus, I spent virtually none of the time that I was at Penn on that side of the buildings, but instead taking a really broad set of topics across history, communication, political science. And the things that I think were really valuable for me, representing the business side of media, strictly a, a suit by traditional standards, um, was having an understanding for how to write, how to communicate, not only in an academic setting, but then also applying that communication style, whether presenting or in bullet point form in a memo or some kind of brief communication um, uh, transmission to an audience and recognizing that audiences vary, whether it's a working team or a C-suite or a board and being able to do that at some level of scale and comfort. I actually got that a lot from having to do essays, having to, having to produce essays, do research, understand third parties, even vetting different sources. Um, I got a lot of that from the academic side of Penn. The advice I would give to my 20 year old self is, and I'm an extreme example of this, I spent four years on the Penn campus and never stepped foot in the Office of Career Services, not once ever. I thought they were gonna tell me there's only five jobs. And by the way, I probably had two of those jobs in my career. So that was a terrible idea. I should have done that. I subsequently met with people from the Office of Career Services and they're lovely and they have really good advice. So go take advantage of those services, but also appreciate that in addition to all the great things that we can get from a liberal arts degree, there is a benefit also from some of these foundational skills that come from understanding finance, accounting, different types of FP&A, which I learned later, but didn't necessarily pick up at that. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Karina, Chantel, any advice for your time? Can, can I come at this from a slightly different angle? I feel like I have a maybe a similar point, but... <laughs> um, I feel like when I was at Penn, I really leaned into subjects that I just enjoyed. It was like learning for learning's sake, right? So again, history, music, film, Italian, German. Um, I am and still am a huge proponent, proponent of a liberal arts education. And honestly, coming from a country where most students don't even have that option of taking that broad of a range of subjects, there's tremendous value there. So similarly to Blake, like I can structure an argument, I can write, I can think critically. These are skills that 100% should not be taken for granted as you learn when you go out into, <laughs> into the workforce, right? So I leaned hard into these humanities subjects at Penn. Um, Al Phil Reese's class really stands out to me. I took a bunch of them. I know he's still over at the Kelly, Kelly Writer's house. Um, I also loved history of the 60s with Thomas DeBrew, who's no longer at Penn. Anyway, I have really wonderful memories of some of these classes. And it wasn't until years later that I learned that I truly enjoyed the intellectual exercise of identifying a business problem and solving for it. It's at the core of what I do today. And it took me a few years to figure that out. So my advice to my 20 year old self and really to any current students is don't be afraid to step out of your comfort zone, really. I know that that sounds like trite, but take advantage of the breadth of the course options that you have and try something new, whatever it is. If you're, if you're leaning hard into business, take something else. You know, you, you might be surprised and uncover an interest or a skill that you didn't know about. And the ironic thing is, while I was at Penn, I gleefully ignored my dad's admonitions to take the business classes, right? My dad's a businessman. One MBA later, I've actually proven him right, and he will never let me forget it. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I would actually add to that, uh, which is funny because I deal in numbers all day. And I think that was my only C at Penn. And it was like math for poets. I forget what it was called, but, you know, I'm just terrible in that. So, but I agree with, with uh, what the panelists have said. I think what I would tell my 20 year old self, which is a little bit different than Blake, I did use career services and I was able to get a ton of really interesting internships that allowed me to do research without having this like math and business background. It let me get on the ground experience, which then I was able to use and start a career in a more math field, even though I wasn't a math major. Um, so I would definitely recommend taking advantage of, if I had to go back and tell my 20 year old self, I'd say keep taking advantage of all of the things uh, Penn offers students uh, and the alumni network uh, and just you know use those resources. Yeah, definitely. That's great advice from all of you. And, and speaking of advice, 
what would you tell current students looking to get into the field or maybe even alumni looking to make that career switch? Uh, Chantal, I'll start with you. All right. Um, thank you, Zandria. Um, I always say that my career trajectory has been somewhat circuitous. Um, I got a master's in journalism. I spent five years as a journalist. Um, after a few years, I saw that the career options that were open to me uh, in that field were not what I wanted really long term. And so I, I looked to make the transition to marketing. Um, I'd, been, I'd been at The Economist at that point. I'd been doing some social media work. And I leveraged that experience, which was sort of indirect, but to get a job as a social marketing manager for Spotify. And um, I also leveraged the, my Brazilian background, et cetera. And so the job was actually based in Brazil. So I was part of the team that helped launch Spotify in Brazil and in, in a number of markets in Latin America. Um, from there, I went to BuzzFeed to work on branded content. So still sort of in the content arena, but very much then focused on translating brand marketing objectives into BuzzFeed style content. Um, and then of course, Marriott, where my experience at that point actually translated nicely to a focus on digital marketing in support of the hotels in the Brazilian market, which was my first role for the company. I think two things to people considering a career change. Um, one, don't be intimidated if the experience that you do have doesn't perfectly match up with a job description, right? Your experience will often bring with it sort of valuable perspective that can work in your favor that employers will recognize. And so don't let that be a deterrent. I always say like you, you write your story, right? So it's, it's, you know, it has to do with how you frame up the skills that you do have and the strengths that you can lean on. Um, and that will work in your favor. So don't, don't be deterred if you don't match up a hundred percent with, you know, the, the new role that you're trying to migrate into it. Cause your story tells a lot about you. Um, I'd also say that uh, a few years into my career, um, I did some sort of very needed introspection around what really motivated me. And it was not at all work-related. I actually landed on some experiences that I had while I was at Penn. So I was uh, the music director of Quaker Notes, the all-female acapella group while I was here, and it was lovely. And I also conducted the Pitt Orchestra for a couple of the spring break musicals my senior year. Um, those experiences of sort of leading a group in service of a, a greater goal, right? A greater objective. Um, that was the insight that I landed on in terms of what really gets me going. And I've leaned into that ever since. Um, so I would say that especially if you're looking to make a change, try to get clarity on what really motivates you and don't necessarily look to your job for the answer, right? Especially if it's a job that you're trying to move out of. Um, I think that's really helpful as you design your next steps and as you look at your options. Uh, for me, anyway, having that clarity was extremely valuable. Yeah, I think that's really good insight. And Karina, I'd love to hear your take as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, following along what Chantel just said about like having like an interest or a passion, you know, use the Penn Alumni Network, use LinkedIn. Penn folks want to talk to alum, you know, young alumni. They want to talk to students. Like we want to talk about our careers. Uh, ask a ton of questions. If I had not asked my professor you know, is there a career in this? I maybe would not be in research. I would not have had this 20 career, 20 year career if I hadn't spoken to him. So network, ask people questions. If you have a passion about something, ask them, can I make a living doing this? Like, what do you think? And people will give you some advice. And, you know, if your personal circumstances allow for it, if you're in school still, do internships, get experience, see if you like something, if you don't like something, where your interests are. And if you're alumni, you know, something that has helped me kind of build my data science background, because I do not have that background, is I've taken a bunch of uh, certifications from Coursera, and I've spoken to people in the field, and I have a general understanding of what data science is. So they're able to, you know, give me some advice about how they would apply it day to day. So um, lots of awesome courses in Coursera I could get you started in a new career um, if you take a few courses and uh, network very heavily. Yes, definitely. And Blake, what's your take on this? You know, I'll I'll build on what Chantal and Karina both said, which I thought was so thoughtful, um, and expand it to sports as well, because I sort of sit in two worlds, and this this topic comes up in both. I meet a lot of people who say either how do I get into digital media, or how do I build a career in sports. In in both cases, they're actually the same. One understand the business of both. People often fall in love with the concept. Chantal talked about this a little bit. People often fall in love with the concept of saying, 
oh, I want to make social content or I want to be on you know, digital media is interesting. I spend my time consuming videos and going online to websites. How do those businesses make money? Understand what makes them sustainable. What makes them, and what are the jobs that people have there? Some of them are specifically focused on producing the things that consumers and customers actually see. But additionally, there are roles in a wide range of areas, marketers, events, accounting, finance, all these different areas. The more that you can put together to understand how these things operate as a business, the better off you'll be. When I apply that to sports, it's actually even more profound because the sports industry, having been in it for a decade, is remarkably small relative to the size of uh, mind share that it takes up for most people. But sports is right quite large when you consider how many organizations that people don't think of as being part of sports that are. Case in point, my colleagues here are from Marriott, an NFL sponsor and a great and longtime partner of the NFL, and Google, one of the most important strategic partners that we have that carries everything from our clips and highlights to powering a whole range of the experiences that we produce on digital media properties. So the other thing that comes up a lot when I get asked the question of how do I work in sports, but the same is true for digital media, is understand that ecosystem as much as you possibly can. Do so by leaning into these pen networks, to LinkedIn, to all the great things that you know Karina and Chantal referenced. And note that if it's the case of sports, there are many people who will have long and fulfilling entire careers working in sports who never work for a team or a league. They work for Pepsi, Verizon, Anheuser-Busch, Marriott. They work in communications and PR roles. They work in marketing roles. They work in product, data science, a whole set. Actually, data science, to Karina's point earlier, think also about where things are growing and where there is an increasing need. If you're thinking about sports, consider some mega trends that are coming up and where things are evolving too, um, which crosses over into digital media, areas like legalized sports betting. We can talk about blockchain, metaverse, and NFTs in a minute. I said all three to fill in a bingo card for those who are playing the drinking game for this. But so like all along, you, there's a range of different ways that people can try to pick and choose their spots that all fill into a much broader area of digital media. Yeah, I think that's a really critical piece of advice, Blake. Um, and for some current students looking to get into digital media or even alumni who are looking to make that career switch, furthering their education could be the next best step in their path. Um, so at what point in all of your careers did you decide that pursuing a graduate degree was the next best step to take? I'll start with Karina. Yeah, so um, I knew I wanted to stay in research. Uh, I just wasn't sure if I could pay the bills. So I waited a couple of years to see if I could afford my rent and I was able to do it. Um, so I think Chantal, you said you had an MBA. I was like, oh, okay, I don't have to do an MBA. Great, you know, because math is a challenge for me. Um, so I got an MS in uh, research and it was heavy on statistics and methodology and how to build panels and how to do focus groups. And I was able to use that right away into my day-to-day. -day. I looked for a, a career, I looked for a degree that would allow me an immediate, you know, return on investment on it, on, on, the, on the degree. And it helped me build uh, research studies for CNN that I was doing at the time, thought leadership work. Uh, so that's kind of how I decided to, to get that MS. Awesome. Chantal? Um, so I've, I've gotten a couple, I guess. I, st <laughs> I started with my master's in journalism, um, which I guess I graduated with an inkling that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and I intentionally, I was told as I was graduating from Penn, get a couple years of work experience under your belt before you try to get a, a, a master's, right? So I did that. Um, and then I did get the journalism degree, which was great. I mean, um, as a way into the profession, I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult one to break into if you don't have something, either you know, a master's or some other kind of experience under your belt. With relation to Marriott, when I joined Marriott again years later, um, I was fascinated by the business model of honestly the hotel industry, right? It's like an onion, you just peel it back. There's so many dimensions to it. And that's when I really felt the need for a greater understanding of those business foundations and strategies. And it was great for me because as I mentioned a number of times, I was like really into the humanities and managed to like make it through Penn not taking a single math class. I don't know how I even did that. Um, <laughs> and I don't say that with pride actually now. <laughs> but, um, 
but yeah, I think, you know, having, having gotten that now, it really has served me well in terms of my ability to think strategically, my ability to drive business goals. Um, and I, it certainly helped me grow within the company as a result, you know, so, so um, I definitely decided to do that identifying a need or an interest in any, you know, but it, it, it certainly um, paid off. Yeah, definitely. And Blake, what about you? What made you pursue a graduate degree? I, I can't help but point out that Chantal said she didn't take a traditional math class at Penn and doesn't say that with pride. I, I think it could be something of great pride because in my case, and we've talked about this, I graduated from Penn without having ever fulfilled a history requirement, a science requirement, a foreign language requirement. Why did I do that? And how did that work? And I graduated on time. Legitimately, I would point out because I had a sensational advisor with whom I would find alternative courses and literally go appeal to department heads. It was a tremendous amount of work. And I did that though, because I really <laughs> cared about what I was taking and what I was learning. And it actually ingrained in me a level of creative, I call it entrepreneurialism, um, that I just picked up because I thought I have four years of being here on this campus. I wanna get the most out of it. I wanna really enjoy every class that I'm taking. Um, especially because as a, as a freshman, having fulfilled a lot of those requirements, I found there were certain things that I didn't enjoy as much. And I thought, well, if I just take something that's a whole lot harder with a lot more work, maybe that would actually be more interesting. That worked for me. It's not for most, but it worked great for me. That being said, when I graduated college, I never thought I was going back to school. I thought I was 22 and that's it. I'm going to go work in part because I have been working um, as a web developer since I was 15 years old and had been, that was a work study job. It was things I was doing to get extra money when I was in college. And I just expected I would stay in that field. I'd always been interested in media. I went to Penn to go study at Annenberg without knowing that was at all remotely pre-professional. So I thought that was it for me. At the same time, I left, I went into the marketing industry when I, when I graduated college. Um, and then after a period of time, transitioned into investment banking, uh, excuse me, into commercial finance and finance, knowing nothing about how to do accounting, how to actually read a balance sheet. And so I enrolled first in graduate classes. I was living in New York City. I enrolled in graduate classes at NYU in the open enrollment program, not toward anything degree granting, just literally saying, I need to understand these basic skills to be able to go do my job. If it had been today, I probably would have been able to do that online. And I would have gotten a lot out of that. But at the time, that wasn't really an option. So I just picked NYU in part because I was living downtown and it was close by. But I wound up enjoying that so much that I wound up taking nine classes while working full time over the next two years, found that I really enjoyed the classes and came up with a very specific strategy for me, which was as someone who did not have an undergraduate business degree, but decided now that I wanted to be in the media industry, but wanted to pivot into investment banking where I would do mergers and acquisitions and capital raising for film studios, music publishing companies, digital media and internet companies, and a whole range of other businesses in that space, I was really interested in that. And I thought that an MBA would be an opportunity to both round out some skills and particularly do the type of on-campus recruiting that I did not do when I was an undergrad. So mm -hmm. it was great for me. I always point out for an MBA specifically, because as Karina noted, it is a massive investment, both of time and of cost. It, it was great for me because I knew exactly what I was looking for in it and was fortunate enough to, to be able to make that work. It's not necessarily for everybody. It's a great way to learn about a lot of other things that might be of interest. But I, I always encourage people thinking about an MBA to consider both what it is that they want to do coming out and how they'll plan on using that network, both while they're a student as well as um, for the years to come, because that's so much of the investment they're making. If they can take advantage of it, it's wonderful, um, but it is a big investment. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think you and Chantel might have some uh, future emails in your future. Uh, how do I get out of my core requirements? <laughs> Teach me your ways. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that Penn is... Was doing, no, go ahead. Penn, in, it, Penn was doing like a pilot program, I think when we were in undergrad, and that it allowed you to like, there were some creative alternatives to the core requirement classes. I don't know if they're still doing that. I'm sure it's not a pilot anymore, but. <laughs> At some level, I, I, this way, this is, this is unsolicited additional follow-up advice. If you are an undergraduate student and you go to a department head and say, hi, I'd like to take the harder class that has more work. Usually you're going to come <laughs> out on top. Most of the time, it was my saying, instead of taking the 400 person lecture in a 101, I'm going to take a 401 because it's 25 people and it just seems like the course reading is a little bit more interesting. 
that that doesn't always work all the time, but that in part is the the, the piece that I thought was particularly notable. Well, again, yeah, hurt to try. I, I just have to say I'm a little bit mad that I didn't run into Blake and Chantal when I was an undergrad with you guys because I wouldn't have gotten that C because I could have figured out another course and not have to. <laughs> I didn't have to take that math course, so I am a little upset now. <laughs> <laughs> take the harder classes, people. That's the that's the moral of the story. Um, one of the great things about digital media is that it can take you anywhere. Chantel, you've worked for companies both domestically and internationally. So what advice would you give to those interested in a career in digital media outside of the U.S.? Um, so... As I mentioned earlier, I am, I was originally born in Brazil, so I'm familiar with the culture, I speak the language. Um, actually, my family there, at least was at the time. Um, I worked briefly as a freelance journalist, um, and then later, for a longer period of time, at Spotify, at BuzzFeed, and then at Marriott, while I was based in Brazil. Um, so I, it was actually great, because I got a, a good amount of experience with a lot of different types of companies. Um, I would say a few things. If you're a student with an existing network in the country that you're looking to work in, lean into that network as much as you can. Um, that's going to help you get situated. That's going to help you find a job. Um, as with anything, if you're just, if you're completely without, you know, if you don't have contacts, don't have a way to get in uh, through connections or uh, other networking opportunities, it can be more challenging, right? If you don't have an existing network and maybe, you know, you, you are dying to move to a country you've never really been to or you're not super familiar with, you may want to consider leveraging your U.S.-based network to connect with one of the many media companies that have offices internationally, right, or companies in general, right? Um, that's actually how I got my roles at both Spotify and at BuzzFeed. I knew somebody who knew somebody at um, the sort of corporate offices that were based in the U.S., and was able to connect that way. And, and both of those roles came up, you know, uh, through those connections. Um, I, I would say this, especially if you speak a local language and you're familiar with the culture, your knowledge of both US and local cultures will help you stand out um, to a recruiter, right? Um, it, it's hard, it's, it's often hard to find people with uh, that sort of bicultural familiarity. So I think that's certainly something that, that can work in your favor. I would also say that if you're graduating from Penn and if you're looking to work in the digital media space abroad, um, if you are able to get any work experience in the U.S. before going abroad, whether that's a summer internship, whether that's, um, you know, a, a, a first job out of college, that may serve you well. I, I can't speak for all regions around the world. I can speak for Latin America, um, and I would assume a few others. There's usually a lag in adoption of new technologies and strategies. The U.S. is usually on the leading edge, and other countries sort of pick things up at various rates later on, right? In some cases, they even leapfrog over other markets once they do pick up the technologies. Um, I'm looking at you, what's up? Um, but if you can go abroad with some knowledge of current trends and technologies in the U.S., that will also likely put you at an advantage, right? And, and again, that doesn't mean that you necessarily have to get a job right out of school, but whether if you can, you know, leverage an internship to gain some of that experience um, while you're even in school, I think that will be helpful for you uh, as you try to make the move. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that insight, Chantal. And I think no matter where you are, we can all agree that digital media is ever changing. Uh, but one thing's for sure, it is here to stay. So Blake, I want to throw this one to you to start off looking ahead. Where do you see job growth in digital media in the future? There's so many areas. Um, you know, I talked about a couple earlier. If I start just what's closest to home over here, um, the entirety of the sports business, which has had such a, a significant role in driving media consumption, especially digital media consumption across the United States, think about how live games are broadcast and the fact that those games are going to live not only on an increasingly differentiated set of distribution endpoints, meaning streaming services, other websites, other forms of um, 
uh, ways to consume it than you've ever seen before, but also the way that that can actually be broadcast itself, the way it can be presented, it is going to continue to evolve, whether that's in the form of personalization, whether that's in the form of new technology like augmented reality that enables different types of experiences for people to watch. So I picked that as one example, uh, one, because it's a little adjacent to, but related to digital media, because digital media, frankly, powers all of that. We couldn't do any of this in an era um, of four broadcast networks and a handful of cable channels. So one is the evolution of, um, of, of live game viewership and digital video. The second is legalized sports betting within the entire industry uh, across digital media. If you are a writer, if you are a business person, there is content increasingly for what is now uh, more than half of the states coming online and more to come. This is gonna be an increasing part of how people consume sports in this country and a lot of different ways to participate in that. Um, across the digital media ecosystem. I made jokes about blockchain earlier, but there's nothing to joke about with the just sheer volume of investment activity going on in that space, whether it's in NFTs or also in a, a range of other technology services, having an expertise in Web3, being interested and leaned into Web3, there is so much that's going to continue to evolve um, in the coming years. And then finally, I mentioned a couple of times, but new forms of storytelling, um, especially that are technology enabled and tech supported. So whether that's virtual reality um, or augmented reality, um, you know, one of the brilliant things that Snapchat did was rather than say it's augmented reality using spatial computing, they called it lenses and enabled a, a five-year-old to realize that if in the case of my family, if my child puts her tongue in front of the screen, she vomits rainbows. That's actually remarkably powerful when you consider then that that evolves to something that um, supports a whole range of new ways to communicate and engage with people. And this overlap between communication and media is, um, you know, is, is as present now and growing as it's ever been. Yes, definitely. And Karina, Chantel, anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would add, we, we talked about it already. Um, if you're analytically inclined, check out data science. Every single digital media company has data scientists working for them. Now it's a booming industry uh, and it's quite interesting. Um, I would also add the online creator economy. I'm sure everyone probably has TikTok. Uh, there are entire businesses and YouTube, YouTube has creators. There are entire businesses um, being built around these kind of new stars, these new like um, Hollywood folks, it's, it's the creators. Um, so that's an interesting um, growing business, I think in, in digital media and I would just, you know, add to, to Blake's, what I'm most interested in seeing is where augmented reality and virtual reality go for advertising. Uh, just using Marriott as an example, like we could be in a world where in a couple of years, Chantal's gonna be designing or helping design an advertising campaign where you put on virtual reality glasses, you can walk into the Marriott hotel room, you can look at the bathroom, you can look at the uh, view. And if you like it within this virtual reality space, from your couch, you can book the room. Um, you know, this has the potential to transform the advertising business. So I think that's one of the, the futures of digital media that I'm most interested in, in seeing how it pans out. Um, we actually did something like that uh, a couple years ago, pre-COVID. All right, uh, yeah, um, for, for like one of our Caribbean resort hotels. And it was actually quite similar to what you just described. <laughs> So that's, that's here, basically. It was not planned. We did not know that. I just made that up. That's awesome. Know, we did not agree. No. <laughs> I love um, that. I would. I think. I think you both um, just were really eloquent about sort of what's super exciting on the horizon. I would just um, just say that everywhere, right? Like every every business that like didn't used to be digital is going digital, right? So there is opportunity, like you know, I think you would argue that with the possible exception of Google, like we mostly work in, in industries that wouldn't traditionally be, be seen as opportunities in media, right? Um, and, and, and here we are. And I would say that every company that wants to be relevant nowadays needs to have that vein. So I think, you know, the, the challenge is know the business as, as the point has been made, you know, earlier today, um, understand the business model, as much as you can, but there are opportunities in media. And again, media is very broad, right? We, we, we cover a lot of ground when we talk about media regardless. Um, and so I think I completely agree with the storyteller piece of the influencer piece, also wearing my international hat for a moment. 
Um, I think there are other markets with perhaps less evolved um, like audience targeting uh, capabilities that are leaning so hard into influencer marketing because it is it is a, the most assertive way that they have to tap into audiences that are very focused into a particular interest. So like influencer marketing is huge. I would say in, in a lot of ways, it has more weight even outside of the US, um, but it, it sort of runs the gamut. And, and I would say that, you know, you can probably have a career in digital media in most traditional industries at this point. Yeah, definitely. And before we move into audience q and I thought it would be fun to do a few quick fire question rounds. So I ask that each of you keep your answers to the following questions to one or two words. So the first one is describe your experience in the digital media industry in one word. Karina, you can start. <laughs> Dynamic. It's a good one. Blake? Ever evolving. True. Uh, complex. All right, we'll go in the same order for the next one. What's one word that sums up your time at Penn? Eye-opening. Mm. Atypical. <laughs> um, foundational. Okay. I love that, that's a really good word. What's the number one quality you look for in someone who wants to work in digital media at your company? Curious. Okay. Okay. I, I was gonna say that too. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll at least take license on another one. Hustle. Collaboration. Love that. Who is one person in the industry who inspires you? I'm very sorry I didn't have one. So I'm very inspired by the first of something. So the first female CEO of an advertising agency that's been around for 100 years, or the first um, non-binary, you know, leader of a company. Like I am very inspired by those stories from a DEI perspective. So I would say all of those folks. Awesome. All right, I'm coming at this with a very, very pen-centric answer. Benjamin Franklin, and here's why. Yay. You're talking about an original digital media person in this way. You have someone who came in essentially as a pamphleteer, creating media of its day, of its kind, constantly changing, leaning hard into the future, being willing regularly to innovate against himself. And meanwhile, what does he do as a side hustle? Go out in lightning storms and deal with whatever's going on and then write about it. Constantly creating content, functionally as an influencer, while also acting in a whole range of other areas and trying to figure out a bunch of stuff that he knew nothing about, which is the closest I can come up as a proxy Karina to data science. So not a typical answer, but yeah, I'm playing to a home crowd here. So let's go with that. I love that. I love it. Add the box. I think you win the prize on that one. Um, uh, I'm gonna keep it close to home. Um, Mandy Gill, who is the VP of marketing for US and Canada at Marriott. Um, Perfect combination of sharp business acumen, deep subject matter expertise that I can only hope to emulate in addition to being a wonderful human being and leader. Awesome. That was fun. Thank you, guys. Uh, we will now move on to audience questions that have been submitted. Um, so the first one is, what are the biggest opportunities or competitive threats to your current digital strategy? Who wants to take this one? Uh, okay. I, mean, I can, I can yeah, jump in. So I think the, the opportunities that we mentioned is the new uh, frontier of advertising, virtual reality, you know, how can YouTube and Google search tie into what is coming in this Web3, um, you know, universe. Um, I think challenges um, which have been there many years before, they'll be there in the future. This is a growing, evolving space. You know, TikTok did not exist four years ago. And, you know, we're all kind of, as a digital publisher, competing for the same eyeballs. We want folks to check out our platform. So I think it's just going to be evolving, um, you know, different uh, competition, maybe not a competition, different other folks that are going to be doing very similar things. And it's just, you know, helping the consumers get what they want and evolving as a company. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, and I'll throw this one to Blake. What advice would you give to current undergrads who are applying for internships in digital media? What should their portfolio look like and what skills do employers usually look for? Put yourself out there. Don't be shy. I, Steph Curry's a volume shooter. It worked out well for him. Do the same. Uh, the Penn Network is great. Uh, not everybody is going to respond to you, but if you put enough feelers out there and you find that fine balance between persistent without being annoying, which is a feel thing, and, and you, you, will, you will address it along the way. But if you do that, enough people will respond to you and get back to you that that is a place to start um, and try to find something that makes you different and communicate that when you do there's two separate pieces to this. One is finding the role, the individual who's going to follow up with you. The second is then when you have the opportunity to connect with that person, um, how you actually present yourself in that discussion so that if you're competing with others for a role because there's some sort of job interview, how you can best separate yourself from other candidates, whether that's through the curiosity that Karina talked about earlier or just showing that you've done your homework. Um, and whether that's you know a role that requires a portfolio because you're showcasing creative talent or some type of writing or something that might be more business minded where you can show examples of work that you've done that shows how you think strategically or manage teams, um, find ways to separate yourself. Again, the resources at Penn are actually tremendous to be able to do that, notwithstanding my not having taken advantage of them when I was there. Um, it, there's a lot of different ways to, um, to do it. Yeah, definitely. I, de I completely agree with that. Um, and Chantal, I'll throw this question to you. What's an example of a skill that you didn't pay much attention to early in your career, but you've since discovered is pretty essential to your career? Ah, that's a great one. Um, Karina, I feel like you'll appreciate this. Um, again, I was uh, I had a real focus on sort of an analytical perspective, but from a humanities side, right? So I was very much into the writing um, and and and. Uh, yeah, humanities. Um, over time, I've actually, people who know me now from work are like, you're the most data-driven person that I know. Like, how is this possible? When I tell them what I studied in school, it's, it's pretty remarkable and also makes me want to kick myself um, for not having taken more um, data science or analytical or statistics related classes at Penn because it's become a real um, asset for me, actually. And it's become a real uh, focus and in a way that I approach problems, that is something that I 100% was not aware of at the time. Yeah. Karina, are there any skills that you wish you had paid more attention to early in your career? Um, you know, just, just hearing Chantal talk about data science, I don't know if it's a skill, but it just dawned on me that there's like soft skills, like collaboration and things like that, like what you do in group projects, like work is a group project, a huge group project every single day. Like that's all you do, group projects. So I feel like, um, I think I paid attention to that skill, but I think that collaboration, working in a group, being able to share perspectives, coming together for a final uh, POV, a final project. I think that's actually gonna serve everyone really well. Uh, the students now that get, um, you know, get more, uh, roles in digital media, because it really is one big group project every day. <laughs> Definitely a huge group project for sure. Uh, Blake, any any skills you wish you had paid more attention to? Um, it's less of a skill and more an appreciation for the fact that the great people that you're meeting, whether on campus or in and around Philadelphia and throughout the area while you're a student, um, represent the building blocks of a network. And you're going to have the benefit of being able to connect with those people if you maintain close ties with them for the rest of your life. Hopefully, first and foremost, because they're your friends, they're people that you care about and you value those relationships, but invest in them. Um, the amazing thing about communication tools now, whether it's something as um, you know abstract as VR and the metaverse or something seemingly mundane like LinkedIn, is that they enable a level of connectivity that didn't exist as recently as 15 years ago. And if you, use that and intentionally focus on it, first and foremost, you're going to have a more fulfilling life because you're going to have the opportunity to just regularly keep contact with people, not for the sake of it, but because hopefully you enjoy their time and company. But additionally, when you do that, you'll get so much more out of it. Um, and, and I think that's even somewhat lost in the um, some of the criticism of social media because it can be so focused on people um, uh, trying to communicate one to many, but the fact that it's a communication layer at its core 
can be really valuable. What do you do with that professionally? By having a network like that, these are people that you can tap into first and foremost for advice, for feedback, for different things. Penn is an incredible community. You're going to have friends that go off and do a lot of things, or if you're a graduate already, that are doing hopefully a broad range of interesting roles. Um, and that's going to change. Look at the three of us on this panel, the four of us actually, Xandria, for you as well, that have all done a number of different things, even in our careers to date, um, whether different types of roles or different companies to work for. Those are all people that you'll be able to get advice from in the future. Yeah, definitely. Can, I, can I add one, one comment to that? Can you say one thing? Um, I'm dating us guys, but Facebook came out after we graduated or the year that Blake and I graduated. The spring, so we the spring didn't of have our the senior advantage. year, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And I actually refused at first because it was like only limited to the Ivy Leagues. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and I actually was like, I kind of like initially like didn't even want it. Um, but I mean, I joke, but like that's like that's a huge, you know what I mean? Like we take it for granted now, but like we actually didn't have that. So if it was somebody that you wasn't like your inner friend circle, you just lost touch with. So mm-hmm. like lean in 100 percent, like everything you said, but like. If you think about it, like we had a much harder time, it's, it's so much easier to connect these days and to stay in touch. Yeah, and I think it's it's so valuable to to speak with people and friends across all different industries because, like like we said, digital media is everywhere. Um, so I just want to take a moment to thank our audience for being here, and of course, our amazing panelists for being here tonight and sharing their wonderful insights on their careers in the entertainment and media industries. As we know, the digital media industry can be really competitive and tough to break into, but you all have shown it's possible to succeed within them. Um, I will now turn it over to Kari Austin-Rouse for closing remarks. Thank you, Alexandria. Hi, everyone. My name is Kari Austin-Rouse. I graduated from the college in 2016. I currently work for the Walt Disney Company, and like PJ, who introduced this event, I'm also currently a member of the Penn Arts and Sciences Ambassador Council. I've attended several career conversations, events like this in the past, and I thought this event was so, so great. Thank you to Alexandria for moderating this insightful discussion, and huge thank you to Blake, Karina, and Chantal for contributing to this awesome dialogue about your careers and insights into the digital media industry. Uh, Overall, we're incredibly fortunate to have engaged alumni like everyone on tonight's panel to continue to provide this kind of programming for Penn alumni and current students. Virtual events like this have honestly also allowed us to stay connected on a global level during this time. So as we wrap up, I really encourage you to stay in touch with Penn Arts and Sciences. There will be events like this in the future, of course, but you can connect on social media through the at Penn SAS handle. You can also support by joining Ben Connect, the college's mentorship platform, or donating to the Arts and Sciences Annual Fund. And we'll add links to both of those programs in the chat. So that's it from us tonight. Thank you everyone for attending, all of our panelists, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.